What's up everyone, Nick here, and in today's video, we're once again going to be covering the progress I've made on my latest 3D printed cosplay, the Mark 46 from Captain America Civil War. And in this video, we're also going to be covering how I built the latest version of the Unibeam we're going to be using for this costume. So without further ado, let's get right into it. There we go. In the last update video, I covered how I motorized the back flaps as well as the chest panels and how I added sound effects to all of those. And since then, as you can probably see, I've done so much. For one, I 3D printed the remainder of the parts needed to build the entirety of the suit, namely the neck seal. Now neck seals on an Iron Man suit and most cosplays for that matter are pretty tricky to get right because not only do you want it to cover the entirety of the neck, but you also want it to be comfortable. You don't want it like literally strangling you at all times. So to get the scaling right on a neck seal is very, very important. Thankfully though, I was able to iterate the neck at different scales thanks to the FL Sun B400. It's a fantastic Delta 3D printer by FL Sun with a decent build volume of 300 millimeters by 400 millimeters. And it also has a max print speed of 600 millimeters, which is pretty dang fast. So within a couple of days, I was able to print multiple neck seals until I landed on a design that would fit me just right, like this one. And snap that right there. There we go. And there you have it. I can't move my head all that much and I can't really look down much, but it perfectly seals around my neck and it's fairly comfortable. There's nothing digging into my neck or anything. And I still have like decent mobility. I can still move my head and whatnot. It's not the best mobility in the world, but it'll do for this suit. Unhand me, you fiend! I don't even know if you guys could hear that since the mic is down here. Let me put this aside for now. So not only are Delta 3D printers fairly fast due to their very unique design, FL Sun also included built-in clipper firmware into the 3D printer and its sonic pad, which means that if you have an accelerometer, you can easily calibrate it for vibration compensation. Now, what does that mean? That means that you can get the best possible quality out of your 3D printed parts without any of the imperfections that are caused by the sheer speed of the 3D printer. And when you combine that with a fairly reasonable price, the FL Sun V400 is an awesome offering. And on a totally personal level, I just think the 3D printer is visually very cool. <laughs> I've personally never owned a Delta style 3D printer until just now with the V400. So assembling it was definitely a unique experience and I found it really cool. And not only that, but seeing the tool head move around on those crazy crossbars as it prints is just mind boggling. I can easily sit down for multiple minutes at a time as I start a new print and just see it work. Also, I really like how the logo lights up. It reminds me of Tron a lot and I think it's really cool. And with that said, I'd really like to thank FL Sun for sending me the V400 and please stay tuned for more content featuring the V400 in the upcoming months. And if you'd like to buy your very own FL Sun V400, I have an affiliate link in the description down below. And if you use the coupon code FLSUN400 at checkout, you'll get an additional discount on your purchase. Now let's get back to the suit itself. So since the last update video, I have gone through the process of disassembling the suit and starting the sanding process. And since I last wrote that part of the script, I've since completely sanded the suit and painted it as you can see. So for context, that's about three-ish, four-ish months, which might sound like a lot, but given the amount of parts that were involved with this suit, it's a miracle that this thing is even painted right now to begin with. If you're not familiar with my personal sanding process, I'll leave a link somewhere up here to that video where I sand the Mark 42 helmet and cover the entirety of my sanding process. But just a quick TLDR, I spend about 90% of the time sanding just with 120 grit sandpaper to get rid of like most of the layer lines. I'll start with my electric sander and then I'll use actual sandpaper to reach all the nooks and crannies that I can't physically reach with that sander, which on this suit is a lot of spots. For example, let me show you the inner details of this suit. There we go. Fully motorized, of course. Everything you see here that is currently chrome, I had to manually sand with actual sandpaper. Now, there are some corners here that I was able to sand with my electric sander, but for the most part, everything here I had to manually sand by hand, and this took like a solid week. And once I was done sanding everything with 120 grit, I basically drenched this chest piece in filler primer to get rid of some of the layer lines. And then I came in with some spot putty to fix up some imperfections and whatnot, and used 220 grit to start the smoothing process. And then I just rinse and repeat that step with 220 grit and spot putty until I got rid of most of the imperfections I didn't like. 
and then I just sanded it smooth with some 400 grit and some 800 grit with wet sanding. Which if you don't know already, wet sanding is the process of sanding apart under running water. That way you're less prone to leaving imperfections on the surface as you sand because your sandpaper isn't getting clogged with whatever it is you're sanding. And this process basically applied to the entirety of my suit. I started with 120 grit, moved to 220 grit, and then 400 and 800 and so on. And while I started the sanding process, I also began testing paints for this suit. So number one, I decided to go with a base coat of Duralumin Chrome by the Digital Armory as the base coat for this costume. This was kind of a no-brainer. Digital Armory makes fantastic chrome paints for a decent price. If you don't know about them already, I highly recommend you check them out. Next up, I used One Hit Wonders Ruby Red Candy Intercoat. This paint is pretty interesting and I'm probably gonna use it some more in other projects. Now their candy intercoat is fairly particular because usually with a candy paint, it's mixed into a clear coat and applied over a surface to get that really reflective finish. However, their candy intercoat does not need to be pre-mixed into anything. You can just spray it as it is. And unlike certain candy coats, the paint isn't going to become lighter or darker depending on how much paint you actually apply. In this case, the candy intercoat is only going to be affected by what you use as a base coat. So in this case, if your chrome is darker or lighter, it's going to have a direct impact on the actual color. But the amount of coats of paint you actually apply to that part won't have an effect on the color, which is really nice for consistency. I hope that made sense. Point is, it was really, really easy to spray on, unlike some other candy coats I've tried using in the past, so I'll definitely be checking out One Hit Wonder some more for other projects. And for the gold paint, nothing too crazy. I used Createx's Gold Chrome Paint, which is a very nice sparkly gold finish. And just to switch it up a little bit, for the actual finish of the suit. Instead of sealing it in a gloss clear coat, which I did for the red and the chrome, I sealed it in a satin clear coat. And the reason I did that is I wanted to have a variety of different surface finishes on the suit to make it look more realistic, I guess, because on the Mark 20, as nice as it is, it has a very monotone finish. Everything is super glossy all around. So it almost ends up looking like plastic, which, you know, it is, but it really does look like plastic. In this case, you have the chrome finish for the metallics, you have the red gloss, and then you have a satin gold that kind of breaks up those finishes, which personally I think is really nice. Now, speaking of paints, the reason why this suit was not ready for WonderCon a few weeks ago is because I screwed up. I was in a rush and I applied my paints way too heavily and way too fast. So the gloss clear coat on a bunch of these parts didn't have time to cure and settle. So instead of completely ruining the paint job by trying to assemble and rush through it, I decided to leave the parts to sit for a while and cure while I went to WonderCon, and now it's been a few weeks and everything's cured, so I can finally start assembling it. So the new plan is to have this entire suit ready to go for C2E2. I just had my very first test fit with all the parts earlier today. Everything is currently working. I just need to work out some of the kinks, but yeah, the suit should be ready for next week. So that pretty much covers all the updates I've done with the suit. Everything else I haven't covered in this video have been covered in previous videos, so I highly recommend you go check those out. Now, the only thing we have left to do is to talk about the brand new Unibeam I built and for me to show you guys how I actually built it. So let me move some of this aside and crack this open. And this project would not be possible without this channel's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is the industry leader when it comes to PCB fabrication and 3D printing services. From custom circuit boards to innovative 3D printed prototypes, PCBWay offers unparalleled quality, fast turnaround times, and competitive pricing. And if you'd like a $10 discount on your very first order, I have an affiliate link in the description down below. So if you'd like to order your very own electroplated arc reactor from PCBWay, I'll leave a project link in the description down below. Now, before I crack open this brand new Unibeam I made for this suit, we need to talk about the old Unibeam and why I even made a new Unibeam in the first place. So here we have the old one. Now the old one is really, really cool, but it has a lot of problems. Number one, this aluminum case that I have 3D printed by PCBWay. It's really cool and I really dig it as a prop, but functionally it's not ideal. Number one, it's way too heavy for the use case I'm doing in this suit. The Unibeam is held in place only by this magnetic pogo connector, which sits into the chest. And depending on how you move and how you wiggle around in the suit, 
it'll disconnect or it'll get loose and the light will flicker or reboot and it'll do a whole bunch of weird stuff. And on top of that, there's no holes for ventilation of the electronics inside. Now, normally that wouldn't be a problem, but there's quite a few things going on inside which leads this metal case to overheat to an absurd degree. Like I'm talking scorching hot, burn your hand type hot. For one, the NeoPixels are set to max brightness, so they get really, really hot. And I also have an ATtiny85 board in here that's running the NeoPixels. And on top of that, I also have a Wemos D1 Mini, which is an ESP8266 board, which is in here to communicate wirelessly with the soundboard. That thing gets ridiculously hot normally as it is. So this is just like a whole wombo combo of really bad stuff going on in here. And if that weren't bad enough, this thing is just incredibly unreliable because it communicates wirelessly to the soundboard. That doesn't work half the time. So I basically scrapped everything that's going on in here in terms of electronics and started from scratch. So I'm gonna set this aside and we're gonna crack open this bad boy. So this Unibeam is only composed of three 3D printed parts. You have this inner bit and you have this outer casing which has been electroplated in chrome and then you have a clear resin printed part for the actual light itself. So if I undo these two screw holes right here, there we go, the clear piece will just pop out just like that, exposing these NeoPixels. Now this NeoPixel grid was custom made by myself. I'll leave a link in the description to where you can get the Gerber file so you can order your very own PCBs. This can be used with this Unibeam setup or it can be used in any other projects that require NeoPixels. Let's see if I can actually get this out here. So there are not one, but two PCBs inside of this setup right here. Here we go. So you have this first layer, which is the actual NeoPixels itself. And then you have this bottom layer, which is all of the other electronics. So on the inside, it's fairly simple. You have a DF Robot Beetle, which is a small microcontroller similar to an Arduino Nano. And on the top here, we have a DF Robot MP3 player, which is triggering the sound files. All of this is essentially reworked Crashworks code. So if you really wanted to, you could add a button switch somewhere in this setup, which will turn off the NeoPixels and trigger a sound effect of the arc reactor booting down. And then you have three holes, two of which screw into the 3D printed part to keep the PCB in place. And then you have one big center hole, which is to feed the wire from the pogo connector into the board to actually give it power. And lastly, I have this teeny tiny three ohm speaker, which I've glued to the underside of the NeoPixels. This will be very familiar to some if you've seen my Tron Identity Disc video. This is the exact same speaker I used in this project. And for those of you who want to build your very own Unibeam, I'll be leaving the code, I'll be leaving the parts list, and I'll be leaving the 3D files as well as the Gerber files in the description down below. So now, let's see if I can't close this back together. Just like, et voila. There we go, and all we have to do is add this clear bit right over this. If I can align the screws correctly, then we can screw it closed. Now, the reason I didn't use glue and I opted for screws like this is so I could do exactly that. I could open this whenever I need to, do maintenance and close it back up. Also, these 3D files are slightly custom. They are modified versions of Neon Robotnik's Unibeam files. The only difference is I kind of changed the shape of it added screw holes, added screw mounts, and Neon Robotnik was kind enough to add vents to the bottom of this for cooling so the electronics don't get overly hot. And now that this is screwed back together, we can throw this back into the chest and see how it sounds. And now that it's reassembled, all I have to do is pluck it back into the chest cavity like so, and it should boot up anytime now. So you have the wind up of the Unibeam, and then you have Jarvis. And if you had a button connected to the board, which I have pins on the PCB for, you can press it and it'll do the exact same sound effect, but in reverse and slightly modified. So it's like the Unibeam is winding down. And if you press it again, it'll wind back up and turn on the NeoPixels. And that pretty much covers everything for this update video. Stay tuned because in the next update video, we're going to be doing the final suit up of the Mark 46 suit, as well as covering the entirety of the suit altogether. And with that said, I really hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. This thing's gonna be really cool.